1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. chapter 4. Alright, let's look down toward the end of our text tonight and look down at verse uh, 18 and we'll read down into chapter 5 and verse 1 and then we'll read a couple more verses along with it. Verse 18 of chapter 4. Now some of you are puffed up as though I would not come to you. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and the spirit of meekness? It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And then go down to verse uh, 10. Uh, verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. Verse 11, Now, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunk, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Will you please go to chapter 6, and let's look at verse 8. Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, uh, nor thieves, nor drunkards, or no, sorry, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Uh, chapter 7 and uh, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now we'll pray for the Lord's wisdom and help as we approach the text this evening. Father, we do need, we do need uh, not only the ability to rightly divide the Word this evening, but Lord, we need sense of delicacy, but also, God, we need a sense of uh, fear, reverence. Uh, we need a sense of urgency in the matter that we're covering, and I just pray that you would help us with it tonight, and that you'd have your way with us. God, I just thank you for this passage of Scripture, which by believers is oftentimes avoided, and I just pray that you would help us this evening to be able to grasp enough of the truth that's applicable uh, to cause ourselves to fear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, did you pick up a theme in the verses that we picked to read from this text this evening? Yeah, Josiah, what was it? What was it? Fornication. Fornication. Okay, the word fornication was in all of those uh, verses. Um, I want to preach about fornication this evening, and I want to do it in an appropriate way, realizing that we do have not only a mixed gender audience this evening, but we also have mixed ages uh, this evening. One of the things, though, I've realized is, first of all, is that uh, children read the Bible. They should, right? And uh, ch church kids read the Bible. And so if they read words, they're going to learn words, they're going to learn things or allusions to things. And they'll come up with a definition, usually by context, or they'll uh, maybe read over some things and not understand them. 
but I just I know that as as a young person, at least before late teenage years, I'm not sure that I ever heard many messages preached about the topic or the matter of fornication. And I think that probably it was because uh, th there are probably the preachers are being careful not to cover topics that are uh, inappropriate for certain ages. Well, we want to be appropriate this evening for ages. We want to be careful about that. But I think also that one of the things that's often overlooked is not only that the Scripture is for all ages, and the Scripture is not an inappropriate book, but I think one thing that's often overlooked is the reality is that the matter of fornication is something that affects all ages. There isn't an age which is not touched by impurity. And so we'll define fornication this evening as carefully as we can. I think all of us would have a general idea. There's, there's a word that's used in our society that is a derivative of fornication. It's a word that uh, the word pornography comes from. It would be the same word. And that would be the word that's used for fornication. I want to look at the spiritual aspect of fornication this evening. The spiritual act of fornication. Uh, or the spiritual aspect of fornication this evening because that really is where the danger lies in fornication. There's uh, forn Fornication is a very, very deeply spiritual <laughs> issue that has deeply spiritual effect. I won't do this for you this evening. If you have possess a strong concordance or if you have the ability to go on the Google, then you can... Uh, is, it, is it go on the Google... That, the way that George W. Bush, when they asked him if he uses Google, he said, I, uh, I do go on the Google uh, to look at maps and uh, satellite or whatever. I use the Google. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe if you know how to use the Google, uh, then you can do a word of this and, uh, and do a word study of the usage in uh, the Scripture. One of the things you'll find primarily in the Old Testament is that when fornication is mentioned, it's mentioned normally in the context of idolatry. Now, it's not mentioned as a synonym for idolatry. It's just mentioned as part of idolatry. Let me give you, for instance, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 21, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 21, I, we're going to look at Jehoram. This is uh, Jehoshaphat's son. Chronicles. And what's that? Chronicles. Did I say Chronicles? You said Corinthians. Yeah, Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Second, the Corinthians of the Old Testament. Chronicles. <laughs> some, some of the same... Some of the same vowels and consonants. Second Chronicles, chapter twenty-one. Go to go to verse eight. I'll start reading. Uh, in the, in his days, the Edomites revolted from under the dominion of Judah, and made themselves a king. And Jehoram went forth with his princes and all his chariots with him. And he rose up by night, and smote the Edomites, which compassed him in, and the captains of the chariots. So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. The same time also did Libna revolt from under his hand because he had forsaken the capital L-O-R-D, Lord God, Jehovah God of his fathers. Uh, moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah. What was a high place? Well, a high place is a place of alternative worship. It's a place uh, where you could worship God, if God wanted you to worship Him there. But it's a place really of alternative worship. And he, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jude, Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah thereto. I'm going to speculate on some things, but if I had to guess at one of the number one reasons, the number one reason why a lot of people don't turn to Jesus, one of the number one enticements that the Satan gives to people in order to convince them not to receive Christ as their Savior and really just to go to hell. I believe it's fornication. If I had to just list one reason that people will go to hell, it's fornication. Let me illustrate that for you. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, 
but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. One of the great sins of the flesh that people are into all ages, all uh, nations, all walks of life is a sin of fornication. And it's a deeply spiritual sin. Most people who are living in an unmarried relationship, if they consider that coming to Christ means that the things that belong only within the boundaries of marriage will be excluded from their life as a Christian. They'll be sin. They'll be wrong. As a Christian, not that they're not sin or wrong otherwise, but that as, you know, you're going to come to Jesus. This is something that you're turning from. It's fornication. One of the hindrances when two couples that are living together, and not two couples, but a couple of single individuals who are unmarried or living together, one of the hindrances uh, to their growing in the church is a matter of fornication. They're faced with doing it God's way or separating, going their separate ways. And the reality is that the actual reason they're together is not because they're concerned about God's institution of marriage. They're together for the convenience of fornication. And that's just a fact. That's just what it is. Matter of fact, I've had people bluntly state it to me before. I've had people say, I'm not living right. And what they're talking about is fornication. And they said, if I got saved, I wouldn't be able to live like that. And so I'm going to wait. And they're believing a lie, aren't they? Okay. Does God save fornicators? Yes. Can someone who's saved commit fornication? Well, we're being warned about it in the middle of a text that's written to believers. So yes. But the lie that they're told, really, or the lie that they believe is that you couldn't be saved unless you stopped fornicating. Well, do you get saved with no intention to stop fornicating? Not really. I mean, somebody who's thinking about, okay, I'm going to get saved, but this is the thing that I'm going to continue to do. Now, you don't get saved that way, do you? You turn to Jesus and you turn from everything when you turn to Jesus. And so some people think, well, I can't be saved and be a fornicator, and so I'd rather go to hell. And that's actually how the thought, that's actually if, how if they're going to express the words, how it materializes. Do you hear that? I'd rather go to hell than stop fornicating. There are believers who are born again and they've gotten caught up in the kind of sin that is having relationships that belong only within the boundaries of a marriage. And they've decided that it is better to have their sin than to have God's blessing in their life. It's better to commit fornication than it is to serve God. And they, they've just drawn that conclusion. That's just where they're at in their lives. You say, Pastor, are they born again? God knows. Can they be born again? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's a serious matter, actually, if you think about it. I think probably the matter of fornication and its derivatives. Adultery, which is a derivative of fornication and unwillingness uh, to be faithful only to the one man, one woman relationship. Those are areas where folks would just rather not have God's blessing if that's what it takes. And so it's a serious matter. I believe it's the number one tool of Satan to destroy believers and to prevent unbelievers from being born again. And that makes it the most serious matter in the world, doesn't it? It's an extremely serious matter, a matter of some importance. 
when the Judaizers in the church, Anthony, the matter's too serious for you to go off in a daydream and laugh, okay? So just knock it off. We're good. Thank you. Uh, in the early church, when believers were being told by the Judaizers, you have to be circumcised, and then you have to keep the law, and you, you really you become Jewish now that you're a believer. You've got to be a good Jew, or you really are not going to be either have God's blessing, or you're not going to be uh, an actual believer. When the apostles were sent back to Jerusalem to bring the problem of the people that came from Jerusalem, so these people are coming from Jerusalem and trying to turn the Gentiles into Jews. But the Gentiles are believers without being Jewish. They don't have to be Jewish. And so the believers dealt with that matter. And one of the things that they did was they literally gave a letter and a sentence from Jerusalem where they sent the apostles back to the Gentiles and they said, you don't have to keep the law. We're not going to put any burden on you to keep the law. But they said, keep yourselves from meat offered idols, things strangled, meat offered idols, and fornication. In other words, this is something that you can't have in the, in the church. This is something that you can't have in the life of a believer. That's all we ask. Isn't that incredible? I, okay, summarize God's law. Summarize the law and the prophets, will you? Summarize it. Come on, come on. Jesus, Jesus had a man summarize it. Love God with all your heart. Yeah, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And then summarize the law that's given to the church. Keep yourselves from idols and abstain from fornication. Literally, as a believer, these are the this is the emphasis. What? Oh, you gotta do, 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 do. No. <laughs> you need to abstain from fornication, you need to keep yourself from idols. You need to love God with all your heart and love your brethren. That's it. I mean, that's pretty much There are all kinds of promises. There are all kinds of things that that uh, we can secure and that can help us. you got to sit up and pay attention. All right? Just get it together. There are all kinds of things that are for us and that we can have. But guys, fornication is a serious matter. Isn't it? Uh, I have a I have a, a list here of just verses that are used. Now there are derivatives or or words that are used oftentimes in the same context as fornication. Adultery would be a word that's used a lot of times with fornication in the same sentence. Lasciviousness, which is sins of the flesh, would be a word that would be uh, used oftentimes in uh, fornication. But uh, I have three references here on a list. I don't know if you can see this or not with your uh, under age 40 eyes. But uh, from this part of the page, it's just a list of verses that have the word fornication used in them. And uh, the first three, uh, the first three in the list are Old Testament. The rest of them are all New Testament. And so Matthew 19, uh, when the Bible is talking about uh, the the marriage relationship and divorce fornications mentioned. Uh, John eight forty one, Acts fifteen. I referenced this a little bit ago. Fifteen twenty and twenty nine. Acts twenty one twenty five. Romans one twenty nine. In that list of things that don't belong, just similar list to what we saw here in First uh, Corinthians chapter five. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, our text this evening, uh, and uh, verses 13 and 18, chapter 7, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 10, 8, and 2 Corinthians 12, 21. The portion of the Scripture with the most exhaustive reference to fornication is this little passage between chapter 5 and chapter 7. And so it really gives you an idea of our context. In other words, if we're preaching through 1 Corinthians this evening, and I don't mention fornication, I really haven't done diligence. I haven't been honest with the text. Isn't it so? So the church at Corinth is told that one of the major problems of sin that they had 
was that there was a man in the church and it was reported commonly and the idea was the idea of the word uh, commonly there is there's no dispute about it whereas everybody knows it and there's no there's not maybe it's so it's absolutely so and everybody knows it. they're witnessing it's a witnessed truth that there's fornication among you and does the kind of fornication that would have been bad among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And I want to just stop here and just say that the Gentiles think and know, uh, based on the conscience that God has given them, the law is written in their hearts, that fornication is wrong. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? I mean, I mean, a man may say, well, there's nothing wrong with behaving with a woman that you love. And they'll say that you love as though you're married. Or there's nothing wrong with certain things that uh, begin with touching and move from there. I mean, honestly, the idea of fornication uh, is a man and a woman touching and going from there. Anything beyond a touch. And, I, and by that, I don't mean a handshake. I mean an inappropriate touch. I mean a personal touch between a man and a woman. Uh, and anything from there moving uh, to, to anything else. And that would be a good definition if you want to use uh, for fornication. A man and a woman uh, should touch. And that's really the conclusion in chapter 7, <coughs> except for in marriage. Men and women only touch when they're married. And that's a good fornication uh, definition. You say, well, pastor, you know, and I've had people say, well, pastor, you think it's wrong for a man and a woman to kiss? If they're not married, I do. Yes, I do. You think it's wrong for a man and a woman uh, to, you know, to hold hands? Well, let me ask you a question. You think it'd be wrong uh, for me and Brother Charlie to hold hands? <laughs> At least would you say it's creepy? Charlie, yeah, I'm not holding hands with you. <laughs> Don't even ask. <laughs> Alright. Uh, see you understand what I'm saying? In other words, there's there's something to the touch. And it's the sort of thing that belongs only in marriage. And and listen, if you want to teach young people, teach them that. Oh, Pastor, there's no way. In, I, I, I mean, it's so sick and tired of hearing people say there's no way when they start to talk about obeying the Bible. They start with, there's no way in the world. I'm telling you, let me just give you a personal for instance. Last year at Shamir's school, I don't think you were there this day, Shamir, but you might have been. Last year, uh, uh, one of the young people brought up the matter of fornication. You were, were you there? Do you, remember, do you remember when I asked how many people there had parents? <coughs> who were both married, that were both of their parents, and they lived in a home. Were you there for that? I don't think you were no, there. I was. Where you were. No, 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 no. Nobody, including the adults. Including I, I was the only adult there that had the same two parents married to each other in the whole place. And so we talked about this matter actually with the teenagers. You say, well, Pastor, you know, you got to understand the day and age in which we live. Kids are going to... Blah, 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 blah. Listen. Those kids were very interested to hear about men and women not touching without being married. Because all of them would have liked to have had the same parents in the same home. God's way. That's the alternative to God's way. The alternative is a mess and devastated kids and people that don't have a clue how to have a good relationship. Folks, we need to take God's Word seriously. Our kids need us to take God's Word seriously, and I dare you to teach your kids not to fornicate. I had parents that helped me with that matter, and I had teachers that helped me with that matter, and I can say to you, it's helped my marriage. It's given me a chance to have a marriage that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So, please, please consider that God's way is not up for debate. Please consider that if you don't agree with it, your way doesn't work and God's does. If the world doesn't agree with it, the world's way doesn't work, God's does. There are all kinds of single people who have had their, quote, fun. And they're at an age and a time in life 
when they wish they hadn't had their fun, they wish they just had what God intended instead. Because it would have been a lot better. There are people, they get to be my age, 50 years old, 60 years old, and they all of a sudden they realize, I don't have a family. I don't have anyone special. And you know, when you get older, your family starts to die off. You have parents. It's great to have mom and dad to go home to, but you won't always. Someday you'll be mom and dad and it'd be nice to have some kids. It'd be nice to have a spouse. Somebody to love you when you can't do anything for them, but just because of your relationship, the family unit that God intended. Fornication is anti-God. It's the number one tool of Satan to keep people lost. And my friend, it's the number one way to destroy families. And that's a fact. And this is not a debate this evening. You don't have anything to say if you want to argue it. There's no logic on the other side. It's not because I'm closed-minded. It's because the facts are indisputable. It's astonishing that people would wish or would care to argue something that literally is arguing for their own death. Arguing for their own destruction. And so, let's look at a few of the verses and let's draw some conclusions. There was fornication in the church, verse 1. Verse 10, or verse 9, Paul said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So he said, I already wrote you a letter not to hang around with fornicators. He said, I want to clarify that. Yet not all together. There were four letters to the church at Corinth. Did you know that? Two of them are inspired. This is a reference to one that's not inspired. There are four different letters. So there are two that the church knew. Oh, this is inspired. The letters themselves claim to be inspired. And that's the... Uh, so that's what he's, what's referenced here. And then Paul said, Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that's called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no not to eat. So all of these things that are mentioned here, and I think that extortioner is what really uh, brings us into little excursus in the first part of chapter 6. Chapter 6 talks about a brother having a matter against another, and I think extortion would be the matter probably uh, that would be deliberately referenced in chapter 6. Go down to verse uh, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, neither, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Again, the word extortion shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You were some of these things. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. Present tense words. Now, you may struggle with the matter of fornication or any of these things here, but it's not what you are. Ask God, what is, and you put your name there, what is Ryan Price? I'll tell you what Ryan Price is, he's a child of the king. He's blood bond. His sin debt is paid for. He's not a fornicator. He's not an extortioner. He's not a drunkard. He's not a these things that are listed here. It's not what he is. Because his sin's paid for. And if that's true, and it is, then these sins don't belong in his life anymore. And that's precisely what the Scripture's saying here. I've I heard it preached, if you've committed this sin, you're obviously not saved. No, you don't get saved by not committing the sin. You get saved by Jesus Christ dying for your sin and you receiving the gift of eternal life. And when you receive the gift of eternal life, you're not these things. And if you're not these things, then they don't belong in your life. What a fabulous distortion of reality for Christians to argue for any of these things. 
Hey, most Christians don't argue for murder. Most our Christians don't argue for for uh, idolatry, except that fornication is usually a part of idolatry. Do you know that if you study idols, you ever ask yourself, what's the major attraction to worshiping idols? Well, how did, in our context this evening, how did our fellow Jehoram, or Je what is his name? Je Jehoshahoram? <laughs> Jehoram. Uh, how, how did our fellow get Israel to turn away from God? He set up high places and established fornication in them. And fornication is involved in just about every false type of worship. What's the attraction of Islam? Fornication. What's the attraction of Mormonism? Fornication. What's the attraction of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Fornication. If you're not educated enough to know what I'm talking about, educate yourself. It's true. It's true. Absolutely true. It's okay. And so, this is a form of idolatry. A form of false worship. Every false worship has fornication involved with it. Fornication leaves an impression, leaves an imprint in your mind and in your emotions. It has an attraction. It takes something that God has made good and perverts it in an insatiable way. A way that can't be satisfied. It keeps you coming back. And it absolutely destroys believers. It's high time we as believers took it seriously. So this is a problem. I've said before, you know, the matter of fornication, use the word pornography, the matter of fornication is as serious as it is to the degree that it has impacted your life. I don't think there's anyone today who isn't impacted by it. What do we do about it? Well, we need to be pure as believers. I think it'd be fine for the church to get back to railing on immodesty. It'd be fine for the church to start talking specifics about immodesty, covering up things that belong only in marriage, covering up being modest because fornication. I'll be careful saying this. Some of the most popular evangelical churches in town are known as a hot spot, a hub, to meet up and fornicate. The singles group at Calvary Chapel, that's what it's about. You say, Pastor, not a nice thing to say. I've just talked to too many singles that go there to hook up. It's a fact. It's encouraged. It's a way to attract people. I hate to say it, but it's true. It's true, a lot of churches. You may ask the question, why has Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church never started a singles group? I don't think inherently its singles groups are wrong. Why have singles, though? Get married. I, to me, it just you go from one to the other. In other words, you, a, a person who is getting together or fellowshipping around singleness is focusing on fornication. They're focusing on two people in a relationship that belongs only in marriage. I, I don't want to go there, I don't want to elaborate too much on that, but believers, if God's called you to not be single, get married. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says. You say, Pastor, where do you meet? In church. 
with everybody else in a natural, normal environment. If an environment has to exclude people in order for it to be a healthy place, or for it, in order for there to be an opportunity for people to meet, there's something wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to just have teenagers get together, or, or ladies get together, or men to get together, but single people who want to get together for the purpose of finding a spouse are dabbling with fornication to some degree, or looking for it, setting themselves up for it. I don't particularly, um, I don't think I'll lose sleep if you don't agree with me about it. Um, you won't fornicate if you agree with me. I got married without ever having to go to a fornication group. You know how I did? I served the Lord, went to church, met my spouse. I like the word organic. It's such a fresh word today. Organically, naturally. <laughs> and the idea of let's hunt for something. Listen, do that. If you're going to do that, just join a um, a roulette group, a marriage roulette group, where groups get together, throw their name in the hat. You know, they pick out one guy, one girl, they got to get married, whoever they are. That's what you do. It's worse than that what you're doing. The idea of experimenting at marriage, and that's what is oftentimes done, is nonsense. Now, I'm being a little bit extreme about the get married thing, but that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says. And that brings us to our conclusion this evening. Um... Well, let me just, let me, before we get to our conclusion, let me make one last point, and that's that you don't have the right to fornicate. It's not your right. It is not your right. If you want to argue it, you're arguing a vantage point or a viewpoint that's not yours to argue. Your body's not yours. Know you not that our bo your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. And a harlot really is an individual who fornicates in idolatry. Temple prostitutes, temple harlots, that sort of thing. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Fornication, my friend, dabbles with something extremely spiritual. That's why it's involved in idolatry. It's a spiritual act. It's intended as a spiritual act sanctioned by God in marriage between a man and a woman. In idolatry, it's a spiritual act. It is joining a person who has the Holy Spirit oftentimes with a person who does not. How does that, how does that work? How does a person come into contact with someone who does not have the Holy Spirit in that way? It's an important matter, isn't it? You say, Pastor, there's a lot there that I don't understand. Well, it's worth your studying then. He that is joined in the Lord is one spirit. Two believers in marriage, joined by the Lord, joined with the Lord. See, marriage is a threefold thing. It's a threefold covenant. It's a spiritual thing. It's spiritual. It's a man and a woman, and God. And you know, God can be part of a marriage without you even being a believer. Lost people can get married, and in getting married, in the act of marriage, they're acknowledging God. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual matter. In verse 18, would you listen to this? Flee fornication! Flee Fornication. Run from it. Flee means to run. Run. Joseph illustrated fleeing fornication, didn't he? Potiphar's wife grabbed him and he slipped out of his tunic and ditched. He was gone. Out of here. 
He got away. He ran away. Run away from fornication. Hey, the things that come in your eyes on the tube expose you to fornication. Flee it. It'd be nice to have some Christians in this day and age. It happened when I was a kid. It happened to my parents' generation. I remember hunting in the woods or even just walking in the woods and seeing a television out in the middle of the woods when I was a kid. Just you'd be walking down the woods, 50 acres of, of oak trees, nothing there, and all of a sudden you're walking out in the middle of the woods, there's a television. I always wondered about it. And one day, I think I was with my dad or my mom, and I said, where did that television come from? And mom and dad said, well, you know, that used to be in our house. <coughs> but we got rid of it because of the trash that comes on in that thing. Until I was 14 years old, we didn't have a TV in our house. Our TV was in the woods. Flee fornication. If fornication comes in your television, it doesn't belong. Do you hear me? Turn it off. Don't allow it. If you can't turn it off, get rid of the thing it comes in on if you can't control it. Fornication can come on your cell phone. It can come in the internet. It can come on a billboard on I-95. Look away. Turn away. There are women who have the attire of a harlot. Don't look at them. Look away from them. You see them? Just turn your head and look away. David said, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. If somebody wants to be wicked, just look away from them. Don't go to places where those things are. You've got to struggle, and it's the place where the appeal is, look away. Don't read about it in a way that's graphically visualized. You read a book, I'll tell you, some, some books are pornographic. Throw them away. Music talks about it. Get rid of it. Throw it away. Get it out of your life. I'm just telling you, it's so serious. It is idolatrous. If you'd be embarrassed to be caught in a temple, in a chamber, worshiping Diana the way the heathens worshipped, you ought to be embarrassed to have it in your life anyway it shows up. It's what it is. Flee fornication. Flee from it. Christians roll their eyes. Oh, pastor. You know what? you got to understand the day and age in which we live. And we live in a day and age which is much like the ancient civilizations. It's time to modernize. Get some of that garbage out of our culture. It's not new. It's old. What's new is a man who is created in Christ Jesus unto new works, unto good works. What's new is what happens when a person gets born again. That's new. Tired of the world framing things. You're old fashioned. No, actually, I'm not at all old fashioned. Sin's old fashioned. Now, I like the song, My sin was old fashioned. My guilt was old fashioned. My debt was old fashioned. And you know what? I didn't get saved the old fashioned way. I got saved the brand new way. I don't go with that song the whole way. See, being made a new creature in Christ Jesus, created unto good works. Before you're saved, you're nothing but a sinner. You can do nothing but sin. Your righteousness is nothing but filthy rags, and that's sin. But when you're saved, you can live for Jesus. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. I wish I could get the words to ring in your head so you wake up in the middle of the night and hear, flee fornication. When you see something come on the TV, you hear, flee fornication. You see something on the road, you hear, flee fornication. You see somebody walk by and you say, flee fornication. Flee. Run. Say, Pastor, it's embarrassing to run from things. Well, you at least get in shape. I don't know what to tell you. Flee fornication. 
Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Means what it says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. The word uh, own there is idiot. I mean idios. Belonging to oneself. The word idiosyncrasy or idiosyncratic? Idios. Idios. Uh, and what it means is yours. Uh, you only get one of those that's yours. You only get one. You don't get to have this one and then this one and this one. This is mine, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. No, your own. Your own. You get yours. You say, well, I don't know if I like mine anymore. Well, work on it a little bit. Work on it a little bit. You know, my wife, she's not sweet. I think some other ladies are a lot sweeter, a lot nicer than me. Well, teach her how to be sweet. Teach your wife how to be sweet. That's yours. That's the one you get. You don't like it, it's too late. It's the one you get. Mine doesn't look good. Well, exercise her. <laughs> Close your eyes. That's one you get. <laughs> same with the wife, same with the husband. Well, if you my husband... Well, you married him. He thought it was wonderful then. So, well, they've changed. Well, change them again. You say, you think you can change your spouse? I guarantee you can. You absolutely can change your spouse. You sure can. The Bible teaches it. The Bible talks about a husband who's an unbeliever can be won by the conversation of his, of his, uh, of his wife. And I believe that. I absolutely do. I've seen it happen. I've seen <laughs> women try to convince other people that she's winning her husband, but if you actually saw what happened there, you'd see she's just being holier than thou with her husband, letting him know she's too good for him. A lot of times, she's not sweet, doesn't have a meek, quiet spirit like a wife ought to have. A husband can win his wife. Oh, yes, you can. You know, my wife's an easy one. I won her a long time ago. I've still got her. But uh, I want to. if I want to win my wife, I've got tricks. Flowers are a good trick with my wife. Maybe not your wife, but they are with my wife. I can give my wife flowers, and I can pretty much get a desired outcome from giving her flowers. Um, I could be sweet to her, and spend time with her, and give her attention, and compliment her, and lavish praise on her, and I get a desired outcome from that. And the sweeter I am to her, the sweeter she is to me. You say, well, that's just because your wife's sweet anyway. Well, I was a lot smarter than most people when I picked her. But you're never going to be as smart as me, so you got to work with what you got. <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> Folks, listen to me. God's way. It's God's way. And don't go and try and tell me, well, you know, there's this one instance where there isn't either. You can lie to yourself and believe your own lie or you can believe God's truth because that's all there is. There's God's truth and there's your lie. Don't tell me your lie. Tell yourself it. Let the Holy Spirit of God convince you that it's a lie and then just confess it and get over it. <laughs> I, I just, uh, God's, God's got a lot more tolerance for your lies uh, than I do. I know what the truth is. You won't convince me. You won't convince me there's some way that's different than God's way and somehow it's better. It isn't so. And you're a liar. You lie on yourself. And you believe in your lie. And so folks, this matter of fornication, it's a heavy one. It's a serious one. But it's one we need to hear. It's one the world needs to hear. It's one the believers need to hear. And we need to hear it loud and clearly. And we need to heed it. God takes it very seriously. And Satan takes it very seriously. Tragically enough, the world pretty much takes it seriously. They know what the pathway is. They know what the destruction of it is. But even more tragically, 
believers don't take it seriously. That's a serious matter. It's dealt with in the Scripture. It's plainly, clearly written. And it's meant to be lived and applied. And with God's help, you'll find out that it's the key to unlocking joy, blessing, God's fullness, and it's the key to seeing God do things that are impossible if you don't believe Him at His Word. Take some faith, I recognize. There are many individuals who come to this passage of Scripture. You're already at a place in life where you'd say, you know, I don't know where to start from here. You'd be amazed at what taking God's attitude about it would do. Just start where you're at. And just take God at His Word and let God do what God can do. And you'd be incredibly amazed at what God could do. Father, thank You for the Word. And I thank You for the clarity that it's written with. I ask God that any person this evening who would not receive it would go back. Lord, I pray that Your Holy Spirit would just ask them, is it not so in my Word? This is not Pastor Price's idea. This is your word. It's what it says. And I pray that you would help us to be able to embrace it with unshaken faith and to see your blessing as a result. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take prayer requests tonight, shall we?